The Spanish-American War brought about the end of Spanish colonial relevance in the Americas and the new chapter for the United States. While the conflict itself was between Spain and the United States, it actually stemmed from dissension in Cuba as the Cubans fought to gain their independence from the Spaniards. Despite the fact that the United States refrained from becoming involved in the first Cuban movement for independence, known as the Ten Year War, which began in 1868, the young nation took a much different approach the second time around. When Cuban rebels came together once again in 1895 to demand freedom from Spain's colonial rule, the United States became exceedingly interested as well as sympathetic. And because you are a fan of our channel, we encourage you to play War Planet Online. This is a real-time strategy game that you can play on your phone or on your computer. You can build your base, stockpile your troops, and wage war conflicts on an accurately depicted real-world map. The game lets you choose commanders and craft powerful items. You pick your strategy, gather resources, forge alliances, and conquer lands. The units in-game are inspired by real-life weapon systems, armored, artillery, assault, and aerial units, all of which can be upgraded. The team behind War Planet Online has put lots of efforts in making the units look amazing. With a special offer for you, by downloading and playing the game from the link in the description, you'll get 3,000 tanks to start your path to dominance. The game offers lots of different gameplay aspects such as a world HQ, voting for presidents, going to the space station, as well as deadly cross-world conflicts. Are you ready to join the World Planet Online Army and rule the world? U.S. journalism became focused on the events happening with their neighbors, especially due to the significantly harsh reaction from Spain. Some newspapers utilized yellow journalism to push the country in the direction of joining the conflict, and the urge was further fortified by the sudden and unexplained sinking of the USS Maine in the Havana Harbor. The United States battleship, which cost upwards of $2 million, fell victim to an unanticipated explosion on February 15, 1898, which killed 260 of the American crew members aboard. The ship had been sent to Havana to aid American citizens who had gotten stuck in the new rebellion, while the official U.S. Naval Court of Inquiry simply blamed a mine for the blast, not pointing any fingers directly at Spain. The American people seemed convinced that the culprit was obvious, and even Congress called for a declaration of war on Spain. On April 25th, 1898, they got their wish. Initially, U.S. President Grover Cleveland declared neutrality at the start of Cuba's revolution, but anti-Spain sentiment grew as General Valeriano Weyler enacted a new Spanish reconcentration policy, forcing thousands of Cubans into areas guarded by Spanish troops that lacked basic levels of sanitation, food, and shelter, with the punishment for refusing being swift execution. General Whaler, who was serving as Governor General of Cuba, also implemented martial law across the entire country. Likely due to the already prevalent use of yellow journalism and American sympathy for the Cubans, the actions of General Whaler compelled President Cleveland to alter his stance and announced that the United States might intercede depending on how Spain continued to handle the Cuban contention. As William McKinley replaced Grover Cleveland in 1897, the U.S. became more and more keen to intervene. When a letter from the Spanish Foreign Minister Enrique Dupuy de Lomé criticizing President McKinley was published by the New York Journal on February 9, 1898, things began to rapidly escalate, and with the sinking of the USS Maine occurring less than a week later, there was a swift move towards war happening from that point on. Along with their declaration of war against Spain, the United States also came up with the Teller Amendment, insisting that they had no intention of trying to seize power or authority over Cuba. The actual warfare between the U.S. and Spain began at the Battle of Manila Bay in the Philippines, where a huge chunk of the Spanish Pacific Naval Fleet was located. United States Commodore George Dewey received orders to head towards the Philippines before the April 25th declaration of war even occurred putting him and the U.S. Asiatic Squadron in the perfect position to strike after they had arrived at Manila Bay on May 1st. In the early hours of the morning, 
Commodore Dewey told one of his captains, you may fire when ready. After a couple of hours, the Spanish fleet was all but demolished, so Dewey called for a break and ordered his crews a second breakfast. Still, some Spanish ships remained and refused to surrender, so the conflict started up again in the latter half of the morning. Finally, once the afternoon came around, the remaining Spaniards officially surrendered. Even though the American fleet was able to effortlessly desecrate the Spanish opponent, Dewey still lacked enough troops to seize Manila completely, which was now in the hands of Filipino revolutionaries until another 15,000 U.S. soldiers reached the bay at the end of July, and the men launched an attack on Manila on August 13th. Commodore Dewey and Wesley Merritt, the leader of the U.S. land troops that came to the Navy's aid, began what is often known as the Mock Battle of Manila. Essentially, the Spaniards had decided they would rather give up the Philippines to the Americans, not the Filipinos. As a result, while the U.S. land soldiers held the revolutionaries back from the battlefield, the rest of the American troops fought an essentially fake skirmish with the Spanish forces, providing an excuse for the exchange of power between the warring sides. Teodoro Angoncillo, a historian who wrote about the event, stated, The few casualties on both sides in the phony attack were due to some actors bungling their lines or possibly to the fact that very few officers were let in on the charade. Nonetheless, the stunt was successful, and Spain was able to hand over control of the Philippines, which they had dominated for over 300 years, to the militarily superior United States, as opposed to the local revolutionary fighters, and essentially passed off responsibility for the strife in the region to the Americans. Back in June, after the first battle at Manila Bay, the U.S. had focused their efforts on the Spanish stronghold of Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Conflict officially broke out on June 6th and lasted until June 10th, with the results being less innocuous for the Americans this time. At the start of the battle, the U.S. troops were heavily outnumbered in terms of manpower, with a mere 600 Marines and 300 Cuban militia fighters, though they also possessed two auxiliary cruisers, one gunboat, one steamer, one battleship, and one light cruiser. The Spanish personnel amounted to 5,000 infantrymen, as well as boasting seven artillery pieces, one shore battery, one blockhouse, and one fort. Despite their disadvantage, the American naval troops entered the bay on June June 6th and successfully attacked a Spanish blockhouse with their light cruiser. Any Spanish vessels attempting to intervene did so in vain. The following day, the American troops were able to cut off all outside communication to and from the Spanish forces by cutting every cable in Guantanamo Bay. Over the next few days, the U.S. and Cuban troops were able to win over control of the bay through a series of minor clashes until the overall hostility came to an end on the 10th. Meanwhile, the Spanish and American troops clashed again at San Juan Hill on July 1st. U.S. General William Shafter commanded his forces to besiege the village of El Caney, along with San Juan Hill, clashing with some 500 Spanish troops defending the village as roughly 8,000 American soldiers pushed forward to San Juan Hill. The U.S. casualties began to add up, but the troops pushed on and eventually split into two flanks. The goal was to take both San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill. Under one flank, aiming for Kettle Hill, fought the Rough Riders, which was one of four volunteer regiments put together on the side of the Americans. The Rough Riders, alongside the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments, led the charge up Kettle Hill as the U.S. eventually captured both targets. Having no plan of stopping there, the Americans entered the city of Santiago the next day, and U.S. naval forces destroyed the Spanish fleet as Admiral Pascual Soriva and his troops from Santiago attempted to flee on July 3rd. Two weeks later, the Spaniards surrendered the city and subsequently ended the war. The formal conclusion to the war came on December 10, 1898 
when a treaty was signed in Paris where Spain gave up all dominion in Cuba, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Authority over Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines was to be transferred to the United States, although the U.S. would owe Spain $20 million for the latter. While this treaty ended the Spanish-American War, it sparked the Philippine-American War that would come the following year. Due to America's promise not to claim hegemony over Cuba, though, the former Spanish colony was finally independent. For both sides of the war, the events of the struggle were notably significant. For Spain, they ended its overseas colonial endeavors and shifted its focus onto its own domestic needs, prompting a new phase of growth and development, both culturally and economically. For the United States, the aftermath was quite different. The Treaty of Paris solidified U.S. overseas expansion and prompted the United States to become a much more important global power. Although some anti imperial Imperialists condemned the U.S., deeming the government to be hypocritical for their disapproval of European expansionist empires whilst leaning in the direction of becoming one of their own. Even so, the American people supported the actions and belief of their government and were not dissuaded by the consequences of such policies. Ultimately, the Spanish-American War in some ways reversed the roles of Spain and the United States, putting a halt to the expansion of one while inducing the expansion of the other.